This is uh, the Arbitel part four. If you haven't seen parts one through three, they're up here. I mean, you can click that link and, uh, you know, it'll take you to the playlist and this will make more sense. Picking up right where we left off. <clears throat> Ophiel is the governor of such things as are attributed to Mercury. His character is this. I'm really hoping you saw that because I don't know. Um, and let me just double check. Sorry about all the pores on my face. Oh, what the hey. All right. There it is. There it is. Okay. Where was I? His spirits are 10,000. Oh, no. 100 thousand legions he easily giveth familiar spirits he teacheth all arts and he that is dignified with his character he maketh him to be able in a moment to convert quicksilver into the philosopher's stone fool that's p-h-u-l hath this character He changeth all metals into silver. In word and deed governeth lunary things, healeth the uh, dropsy. Okay. Uh, he giveth spirits of the water who do serve men in a corporeal and visible form and maketh men live 300 years. So I just wanted to take a beat and uh, talk. So this uh, this one's going to be mostly talking, even though it'll add one episode to this series, because as you've probably noticed, especially in the last one, um, <laughs> I'm usually putting so much energy into like sneaking around and being in interesting places. Uh, while I read like 30 seconds at a time of, of, of the Arbitel. Uh, and I don't actually have the, the space in my brain to come up with thoughts, let alone say them about what I'm reading while I'm reading it. But now that I've put out those three and watched them all at least twice, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to, like, reflect a little bit on a few different levels. So, um, this morning at 5.15, I woke up to use the washroom, as they say. And, uh, then I laid down and I was thinking about the Arbitel. And I couldn't sleep. So I didn't, and I uh, ended up laying there for an hour thinking, and then eventually gave up on sleeping and woke up. So I woke up at 5.15 today, after going to bed at around midnight. Um, so what was I thinking? Well, ah, gosh, you know, I made notes, so I'll just talk off the cuff for a little while. And then we'll go back out to the balcony where we were before and uh, I'll, I'll look at my notes and see if I covered everything. Um, I mean, okay, so first off, apparently the original text was written, there's like a rumor that it might have been Paracelsus, but it might just be because that's like a famous name and people thought, hey... That was the around the same time and place that where he was. It could have been him, but no real evidence of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, and I I wrote I posted a poem. I don't think anybody. Maybe it didn't resonate with anybody. I thought that with a little bit of reflection, people would be like, "Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point about a lot of things that could be taken on a lot of levels." 
the poem was called uh, The Gordian Knot. That was the knot in uh, the, the story. There was a knot that was so complicated that nobody could untie it, and Alexander the Great showed up and just cut it in half with his sword. And uh, so I wrote The Gordian Knot that every modern human can solve. Quote, gee, how stupid all our ancestors were. End quote. That's the end of the poem. So you could take that on a lot of levels. You could even kind of apply that to the crisis in the Middle East a little bit. A little bit. But it's rude to call people our ancestors when they're actually our distant cousins and they're still alive and contemporary with us. So, eh, a little bit elitist and arrogant. Meaning, um, like, modern as in uh, secular humanist, um, you know, uh, ephemerally based scientific-minded people. You know, people with what you might call common sense until you meet people and then you realize it's not so common. Um, it's interesting how, uh, I mean, I'm old enough to, 45, uh, old enough to remember um, bubbles. Not to say that bubbles don't still exist. They're a little different now. They kind of come in the form of blocking people that are just too far outside one's own paradigm to be able to handle. Not everybody does it. Some people, just as a rule, don't block anyone and they just are open to the cacophony of voices on social media. And some people limit their social media. What a concept. Um, you know, but like, you know, if you live in one geographic location and you go to work in that geographic location, then your coworkers are going to generally, maybe 80% of them are kind of in alignment with the mental paradigm, the, you know, the uh, way of thinking of that region, that city, that whatever. And then there might be the, the 20% that are like, hmm, they're from out of town. <clears throat> they're from a different uh, state, you know, a different place. Or they uh, come from a certain kind of family. Or they came from a different country. Or whatever it is. Or they just are odd. Um, so they have a different paradigm. I, of course, was a little odd myself. But I, I'm sort of a, a, a hybrid of what might be considered normal and what might be considered very odd. And I'm kind of grateful for that because I can, I can walk in both worlds and I'm fairly comfortable in both worlds, but I don't exactly fit in either one. And that's something that, I mean, a lot of people that, you know, come from any kind of mixed background, whether it be religious or ethnic or national, whatever, you know, any kind of they're, they're not quite the one, not quite the other. In my case, uh, my maternal grandfather, Edward, for whom I'm named, was a scientist, and he was very rational, and he, uh, you know, um, was an inventor when he was younger, and, you know, invented the roll film adapter when roll film first came out, so people didn't have to buy new cameras, they could use their old cameras with the new film. And that kind of got him started on being a uh, successful person, and then he went from there. But this isn't about him. Uh, in Chicken Philosophy, Carl Jung, in the first episode, I talked more about him. But anyway, my dad, he was also successful in that he was a teacher. He was an English professor, but he had a strong interest in like the paranormal, demonology, esotericism, Tibetan Buddhism, um, Kabbalah, Hermeticism, tarot cards. You read tarot cards and that kind of thing. And he had a lot of odd friends. And he was the sort of person that didn't filter who 
his friends were. He kind of, I mean, he, <laughs> he reminds me a little bit of uh, God Emperor of Dune. That I have, I don't have allies. I have enemies and students. <laughs> there were people who hated my dad, and then there were his students. And if you happen to be, I've mentioned it before. If you happen to be his his uh, significant other or his son, then you fell in the category of students, unless you decided to be his enemy. I've been both. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't mean to say that I was his enemy, but he was mine. But anyway, those those were two strong influences on me growing up. And so when it comes to something like the Arbitel, I can look at it in a number of different ways. First off, there's that Gordian knot. Wow, gee. <laughs> Glad I don't live in the 1500s or whatever, whenever this was written. Um, people seemed, you know, like you couldn't, you couldn't really find it. Back then, Protestantism was the new, the new uh, wave of thinking, the new, um, you know, the new thing, especially up in places like Switzerland where this came from. At that time, this would have been, I think, I, th my, I think when when the Arbitel was written originally, might have been while Martin Luther was an old man, or shortly after he passed away. Um, I know he had some kind of digestive issue. I don't know if he actually made it to be like proper old, but uh, you know, an older man. Anyway, I don't know when Martin Luther died. It's neither here nor there. But the point is. Uh, yeah, you weren't going to find very many, like, science and reason-based people who weren't 100% invested in um, religion back then, as far as I know. There might have been people who maybe didn't know much about it. And you, know, you might be more likely to find some, like, common sense folk in, you know, among the illiterate or among the, uh, uh, you know, working folk who just were like, oh, I don't have time for all that. I'm probably going to hell, whatever. Give me a drink. You might find some, some people that might be uh, fun to talk to. <laughs> but it seems like, uh, it seems like the, the, the more educated you were, the more, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but the more locked into that, um, very Catholic paradigm by our standards today. I mean, by the standards of modern Protestantism, of with all of its, you know, probably hundreds of thousands at this point of different denominations and uh, views. Generally, I think it's only about ten or fifteen thousand. But um, what's my point? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you've noticed. The last, uh, the description on the previous Arbitel was, you know, Edward eats a cat and walks around a mall while talking about the Lord. And, okay, so that's, that's the, cut the, cut the, uh, the knot with the sword, pure reason. And we live in the era of Ophiel, right, as mentioned yesterday, maybe. So maybe it's because we're living under the influence of that Olympic planetary spirit that we today think that it's all total horse shit. It's a play on a joke I made about being a Virgo. In the, never mind. Um, it's a, sort of a joke. Maybe it's a little obscure. But Mercury. Um, yeah, so okay, okay. So... Basically, I'm not a total nitwit, uh, which might actually turn off anybody who would watch a series on the Arbitel. Um, I, I was on RC's podcast one time, or he was, yeah, I was on his, or he was on mine, or both. And I was talking about how Golden Dawn is like a uh, society of creative anachronism, like nerd, uh, you know, uh, play acting thing. And he said, but the spirits are real. And I was like, I mean, not really. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> you know, and I was saying, I mean, you know, like in the, in the conventional uh, 
shared agreement reality, like in the modern world, that statement is absurd, right? You you know that, right? We both know that. I, I don't know what my exact words were, but it was something along that point. And I think I might have, like, I don't know. Like, the thing is, <clears throat> and this is, like, something that Cobb criticized the Archbishop for, but I'm using a pseudonym for uh, AKHV. AKHV is the Archbishop. Anyway, he was my proctor. Ka was not, but he was a character. Whew. Still is. I'm a good, good guy. Anyway, episode 10 and episode 20-something of Esoteric Nerd, if you're interested. I'm not going to point to it because I don't want to go fishing around for where to put the card. What am I talking about? Yeah, I was an actor when I was a teenager. And I did I wasn't like method or anything, but when I was in character, I was that person. And later in Golden Dawn, uh, when I was the officer, when I took on God forms, um, that went hand in hand with acting for me. And that isn't to diminish magic, but rather to elevate acting. Ka criticized uh, the Archbishop for being an actor and saying that he didn't take anything seriously for him. It was all acting. And even now, as being an Archbishop, he's still just acting. But whatever, Ka, I mean, I like you. But it's the kind of thing where, like, my stepmom criticized my mom so harshly one time that I kind of stopped talking to her. But anyway. Um... You can like someone and not like the way they talk about someone else that you like, you know? But anyway, that kind of brings it back to this whole thing in the Middle East, right? Do you ever, oh, never mind, I won't go into all that, but I don't know. I think in, in both cases, you have you have a regime on one side colonialist regime and a lot of European folk and others who aren't European and then on the other hand you have another regime and those two regimes are both murdering civilians one is a slightly higher number of thousands of civilians but the other is also thousands of civilians. I can't fly either flag right now because then it would be mistaken for supporting one of the regimes and I don't support either. But what I do support is not killing innocent people regardless of what flag they're under. And especially considering a lot of them don't agree with the person who is firing the missiles on behalf of that flag. That's why I'm not posting, reposting memes. That's why, you know, anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that, like ever. And I got burned out on that whole thing in like 2002. But anyway, I was like really into that back then. Some of you might remember the Peace in Jerusalem mugs, remember? Uh, sorry, I got sidetracked. Um, so yeah, my grandma was very Christian, and I think to save me from my evil father, from her perspective, he wasn't really evil, mostly, no more than she was, but, um, yeah, my maternal grandmother, the wife of the, uh, scientific inventor, was very Christian, very Protestant, and uh, wanted to save me and everything. And, you know, I mean, my dad, like, he taught me the chakras and everything. And his, he would say things, my dad would say things like, uh, if I said, is there a devil? He'd say, on a certain level. And so that's kind of would be, at least that half of me would say that the, uh, the spirits, the angels, the archangels, God, these things are real on a certain level. 
for those who don't believe, they're not real. And for me, if I step over on that side of the line, they're not real. And if I step over on that side of the line, they are. And maybe that's confusing for people. For people who need it to be one way or the other. For it to be in a sort of state of quantum uncertainty. Kidding? I'm kidding. But no. Yeah, so my grandma really... <clears throat> she didn't take me to church every Sunday or anything. But I'd see her like every couple months. And she'd take me on Easter and all this. And then when I found out about the time my dad got possessed. I think I've talked about that on Esoteric Nerd. Anyway, it was brief, but it terrified me. And so when I was 10, I said, Mom, I need to be baptized. Don't tell Dad. And I got baptized in a Lutheran church. And then later in Golden Dawn, of course, in the higher grades, it's all very Jesus-y. And in our particular order, it was very Catholic. So I sang in a Catholic choir, became a Catholic in a Russian Catholic church. So I have that side of me where I'm not faking when I say, you know, what, like, you've seen this. I've shown it to you. I showed it to you in the very first frame of the Arbitel, right? Um, so that the rose in the middle makes it a reference to Christian Rosencruz and Rosicrucianism, specifically the R at AC school. But, but also Yeshua, commonly known in English as Jesus. Jesus, if you're into it. Spanish one, never mind. I like it. I like him. I feel like the idea of him as a personification of the great oneness of all past, present, and future. Not probably theologians would have an issue with that synopsis definition, but I, I think it's a good, I mean, I don't think it's good as far as like the fruits by your fruits ye shall know them by their fruits ye shall know them the fruits of Christianity have been pretty fucked up right um, but from from childhood and the thing is like I'm not even talking about the like these days sorry to jump tracks for a second but these days I feel like um when people put something out there, it's like, at least a lot of it, it's like, this is what I am saying. This is what is true for me. And then other people say, debunk it, you know, and like logical this and that and this and that. And everybody's gotta be a sage. There's uh, this great guy, great, I use loosely, hyperbolically even this the guy who called himself Bob Pliskin which is the character from uh, Escape from LA Escape from New York um, so I don't know who this guy really is I don't don't know what he looks like don't know anything about him except for a little bit his personality and uh, we both were like Facebook friends with Cindy Morgan from Tron and then he ended up in like Whittian's Astral Coffee House group on Facebook and I was going through, I think I had just done DMT for the first time, so I was like in a sort of, I mean, not really a messianic uh, phase, but like a feeling like I had seen on the other side of a veil, you know, and, and wanting to share kind of something, not a clarity, but something, and uh, and he was saying you know he wasn't into it he wasn't into like I mean I, I, I appeared to be acting like I knew everything and I, I think at that moment maybe I was like well I do know a lot you know I am a full 5 equals 6 initiate of a traditional Golden Dawn order who's, who's done a lot of DMT you know I mean I wasn't saying that like therefore I am right and everyone else who disagrees with me is wrong but at, at that time I was telling him this is where I'm coming from. But before that, see what happened was, okay, he was like, don't uh, wake people up when they're not ready to be woke up, basically, something like that. And, uh, ish. And then he sent me Suryangama Volume 8, and I will point to that. This, keep that in mind, and I know you may be put off by the, the length of it, 
<laughs> That's what he said. Never mind. Um, but it's worth watching. Basically, it's like a whole bunch of different examples of ways that people can uh, think that they're a sage when they're not. And all the bad things that happen for the student and for the teacher when the teacher thinks that he's a sage and he's not. But I don't think I'm a sage. I don't think anyone's really a sage. I've never been fully convinced that anyone's a sage. The more I read the Tipitaka, the more I think that Lord Buddha was just doing his best. And when I get into that character of um, a Christian magical ritual healing work type thing then yeah yeshua is god and through the holy spirit blah 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 but again that doesn't mean that i don't also like have the ability to criticize just about every line of scripture so it's it's again it's it's an odd place to be but i'm i, I don't really feel um, conflicted about it when people get to know me enough that they see that I contain both within me then they may become conflicted you may be conflicted by it but for me it's not like oh well I believe in uh, intelligent design it's not that no I I'm my main focus is the Buddhist path. I think that um, form is emptiness and emptiness as form is actually accurate. And nonviolence and being mentally, emotionally, and physically healthy and compassionate is a good way maybe the best way that I've seen. Not saying that it's the capital B best or the capital T truth. It's just of all that I've seen, of all the ways, including secular human atheistic materialism um, or that upside down, which I guess would be like communism, maybe, I don't know. Um, there's, there's, of course, Christian communism, which existed before atheist communism, but I'll let Ravi enlighten the world about that through his books. Um, what am I talking about? Do you know? I don't know if I covered any of the points that I wanted to cover. So I think there were some tracks. I jumped tracks before I finished a couple things. The Arbitel. The, uh, the, the, the Olympic spirits were given in the practice grade of the Golden Dawn, and I'm very familiar with them. I just didn't realize they came from the Arbitel. Even though the word Arbitel is mentioned in the grade material I checked, and I was like, oh, that's why the name sounds familiar. And I've heard people talk about it. The thing is, I've never been interested in it. I'm much more... And the guy that asked me um, if I had any videos about the Arbitel, it's like, it's interesting, okay. You know, I'm, I'm like, I know where I'm coming from, and I know where I was coming from when I put up those ritual videos, and I know kind of my take on things, and I know what works for me and what makes sense to me, and kind of what doesn't. And the Olympic planetary spirits kind of fall under the heading of things that don't really work for me or make sense to me, or um, things I've never been that interested in. I've never been interested enough to like look. I never look. I, I memorized what I needed to memorize to pass a test in order to get into philosophers. As far as that's my relationship with the Olympic planetary spirits, and the uh, the way that the way that planetary spirits are kind of perceived in Golden Dawn. See, there's planetary spirits, and there's Olympic planetary spirits, and the Arbitel is about the Olympic planetary spirits, and it's. It's interesting now for me. It's like I was in practice in 
I think I, I went into practice in 1996 and then went into philosophy in 1997. So for me, I'm like filling in gaps in my curriculum from 1996, 19, 1997. And obviously I was very distracted with like my first relationship really and being 17 or 18 or whatever. And um, yeah, I went through processes, but I wasn't that into the Olympic planetary spirits. Um, I, went, I had long hair and then shaved my head in the middle of an invocation of ISIS, private at home. Um, a lot of things involving the beach and the ocean. <clears throat> and um, working with the, the divine hierarchy of water and Gabriel and um, ISIS. I was never one to be like, I want to manifest, I want to manifest something, oh. you know, like the, the kinds of things that I wanted, I didn't want to try to manifest magically, at least not at that time. I wasn't really focused on money, part of that comes from privilege, I acknowledge. Um, and, uh, and I obviously wasn't, wasn't one to like try to use you know, magic to make someone feel a certain way or there just wasn't any reason for me to like try to do practical magic. Like, I mean, as far as like making things happen in the world. Um, at that time. And uh, well, anyway, the point being, okay, so I don't have a tree of life with me right now. So I'm just going to have to like make one here. So here is Malkut. That's the physical world, right? Here's Yesod, the well, astral, to put simply, really the astral's kind of in between these two. This is the astral triangle, not to be confused with the astral plane, which is here, right? Then there's Tiferet, I guess that's my nose, right? Um, which is like, you know, Yeshua or whatever, the center of the center, the, the link between Keter and Malkut. This is the goal. This is symbolically where you get to when you're in five equals six. And then there's uh, the ethical triangle, so Chesed and Yevorah. And then there's the abyss, and then there's the supernal triangle up here. Keter, uh, let's see, Chokma and Bina. I have to mirror it because selfie. Never mind. Um, you're seeing what I actually look like, not the reversal. My point is, you have, you know, your divine hierarchies. So if you want to work with a planetary spirit, you call upon the divine name associated with the planet. Then you call upon the uh, the, the the archangelic level, right? Or you could say this. There's two different ways of looking at it. And then if you consider this the archangelic level, then this would be the angelic level. But if you consider this the archangelic level, then this whole thing would be the angelic level. And then you have the physical level. So the spirits would be kind of somewhere in between the astral and the physical. So like low on the totem pole, in, in other words. Um, so as far as like one who is focused on, on kind of like union with the divine, not so much manifesting boxes or whatever it is people do who are into practical magic. Like, and then there's people, oh no, I want to invoke demons from down below and man, because they're good at manifesting things on earth even better than the spirits up here that are d divine, right? And I'm like, I'm not interested in really either one. But the way that Olympic planetary spirits are approached, at least generally, is if you work with them, you kind of work with them the same way but there's a big warning don't work with these and then there's like you know uh, people who probably read the arbitel back in the 90s explaining oh there's a lot more to them they're from they're on a different system they're not exactly they're not the same as those regular planetary spirits that you know there's because there's the angel then there's there's an intelligence and then there's the spirit and the spirit is a blind force not good or evil just chaos just like kind of like an animal and uh, the intelligence is what guides them, but the intelligence needs the angel. 
the angels, just the astral levels. He made the archangel, etc. Right. So that's kind of like by default how I always thought of Olympic spirits as being similar to regular planetary spirits. But then reading the Arbitel, it turns out like, oh, they're like rulers of this and that. They've got all these dominions under them and, you know, like all these presidents and vice presidents and secretaries of treasury under them, right? So it's, it's been interesting reading this, kind of like getting a bit more depth into something that I was never that interested in. So that's, I mean, basically where I'm coming from, but... Uh, that's not all of the stuff that was going on in my head at 5.15 this morning. That, um, But I did write it down. And so let's go ahead and uh, cut back to the balcony and I'll look at my notes. Okay, so Gordian Knot. These are my notes from 5, well, 6, 6.30, around 6.30, I think I wrote this. Gordian Knot, which every modern person has the answer to. Gee, how stupid our ancestors were, right? Like my episode with RC, the spirits aren't real according to conventional consensus reality. I covered that. Next, uh, but if we pretend we don't, or approach it something resembling its own paradigm or paradigm adjacent. Right, 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 right. So, kind of like... You know, okay, so I was saying that there's like a lot of levels to approach this. So one level is to try to understand what it was like for them. To try to get into the head of uh, people reading this in the 1600s, it having been written in the 1500s apparently, um, and what what it would have been like for them. So, things like saying, read your Bible, you know, keep the scriptures in mind, always in the name of Jesus, you know, that would have been the, that would have been like 1600s for be the best possible person you can be. Now, today, in many places, there still might be a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between be a good Christian and always, you know, do things for Jesus and everything, and that. However, unlike a place like Switzerland or England in the 15 and 1600s, now our world is much bigger. The bubbles have popped most of them, and everyone is able to see that there are more, like, non-Christians than Christians, and uh, that among the people who call themselves Christians, there's, like, Joel Olstein and uh, child molesters, and, you know, a lot of undesirable characters. And these are things that one cannot but take for granted in 2023. So, um, yeah, it's different in 2023 than it would have been in the 1500s. So, that said, two things. One is you have to kind of get into the mental state of the people who 100% 1,000% take for granted that being a good Christian means being a good person. And um, also, separately, if you want to translate it into today's terms, maybe, then you might, uh, you might approach it differently. And as I've mentioned, my, my approach tends to be practice yoga, be vegetarian, um, be a decent person, uh, you know, be generous, give to charity, if, uh, you know, like, if you're, if you're looking for, like, a sure capital T truth, I mean, I'd say don't bother, there isn't one, 
but uh, if you're if you're striving, even though even though uh, it's impossible, you know, shooting for that unreachable star, as uh, what's his name said in uh, Don Quixote or whatever, you know, then uh, you know something like that maybe, or uh, or just be a good person, so, you know, introspect, journal, you know, like. Um, Look for ways that you're being dishonest with yourself. It's easier to notice when you're being dishonest with others. And, uh, you know, like, uh, like Depeche Mode famously said, uh, you know, uh, something about a policy of truth. Sometimes, sometimes you've got to tell a little white lie in order to keep everything running smoothly in life. But there's a difference between that and being deceptive. But if you if you are like a hundred percent, like uh, for a while I was adopting that at different times in my life, and I still, I mean I do, to a, a lot to a high degree, um, stick to raw honesty, you know. But uh, a lie of omission is still a lie, right? Um, yeah, just try to be a, the best, the best, most, not pure, that word has also kind of been tainted by, like, white supremacists and shit, uh, but, like, genuinely pure, not, like, creepy pure, but, like, real pure, like, not... Um, tainted by bacterium, you know what I mean? And um, that bacterium is not a euphemism for... Never mind. Uh, what I mean is, you know what I mean. Do I, I don't need to explain. You, you, I think you get what I'm saying. I'm talking too much. Um, I'm just going to keep going and hope that that was enough. Oh, perhaps a union approach. Perhaps it's uh, appropriate that this channel started out as a, like an, an, a union exploration. In other words, um, to approach these ideas as the personal mythology of the collective unconscious of whatever. So, so in that sense, these beings do exist or might, can possibly exist for you, if you want them to, and uh, the more you get to know them, the more you create them in your microcosm, and your microcosm is also part of the macrocosm. So, spoilers, um, what you create in the microcosm, you also create in the macrocosm. As within, so without. So, you know, and also in addition, maybe also they exist outside you. I mean, in that they exist in the microcosms of others. And perhaps, just perhaps, they exist apart from human collective consciousness somewhere in the astral getting a little too far out and perhaps someone got in touch with them through some means and wrote down these sigils and these characteristics as either a metaphoric approximation of their nature they don't literally turn things into silver or um, an actual accurate um, description of what they do but it's probably closer to a metaphor in that <clears throat> it, it might be like, you know, a uh, fool can turn everything into silver, as in working with such a strong lunar-based being. You can see that tree as a lunar force, my hand as a lunar force. <clears throat> you see what I'm saying? So it's sort of like when, you know, someone realizes they're in the Matrix or something and they're, oh my god, you know, it's like that a little bit. Um, where, you know, turning everything into a rock is like, yeah, it's all solid. 
we're making everything the Philosopher's Stone. I don't pretend to know what that would be like at the moment. Sometimes I pretend to know what that would. Never mind. Um, when I'm when I'm in the in the astral vault and I I'm one with Jesus and I'm healing and doing the seven Typhurits ritual, then then I'm pretending to know what the philosophers do. Or maybe I do. Anyway. All right, I'm gonna keep reading a Jungian approach, right. All right, keep reading, Edward. Tipitaka versus Padmasambhava, right. Did I, I pointed to something earlier. I'm gonna point to one more thing. Buddhist books. Um, every 10 episodes, I read Life and Liberation of Padmasambhava, and in the nine episodes in between, I read the rules from Tipitaka. And so there's a comparison I'm making here where the rules for Tipitaka are a historical account of the man known as Buddha making rules for his monks and nuns to try to make the best possible situation for the order to last a long time and also for each person on their individual path to be able to attain enlightenment most efficiently through a set of hundreds of rules. I mean, Moses had a similar idea, right? Similar, but different. <laughs> for example, for example, I just like to point this out. In uh, Lord Buddha's order, if you're a monk and you have sex, you're out. But if you have sex with a boy, naughty, naughty, don't do that. I mean, you're also kicked out. But the point is, like, for the lesser things, like if you're touching seductively the hair of a lady and you're a man, that's a big no-no. If you're touching seductively the hair of a man, oh, you guys, where, where Moses would have them stoned to death. So that's, that's the difference, one big difference between Leviticus and uh, the Vinaya Pitaka from, uh, from pre-sectarian early Buddhism. A big important difference between all Abrahamic religion and uh, Buddhism in all of its various forms. As far as I know, maybe maybe someone later on made a big taboo about that, but haven't gotten there yet. So when I read the Tipitaka, I, I can criticize it. I can I talk sometimes. I'm like, this is this doesn't make sense to me, you know. But when I'm reading the Life and Liberation of Padmasambhava, it's so far out. It's like watching Lord of the Rings, but more far out than that. It's like watching Fantastic Planet, and so. While watching Fantastic Planet, I mean, it has a political agenda, but still, there's like a moral a lot of the time. To the, I mean, through 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 and through, it's just maybe not environmentalism like Fantastic Planet. But the point is, with the life and liberation of Padmasambhava, it's very far out. I just read it. I don't stop and go, "No, this is kind of funny. Why is the child born?" in the middle of a lotus as an eight-year-old boy. And who are these other boys with indigo skin and pink skin? And why is there a wish-fulfilling jewel? And how did riches suddenly appear? And I mean, it would be ridiculous for me to like stop every time something was odd and like say, this is odd. So it's just the whole thing, the whole thing just gets absorbed as more of an astral experience, more of a, <clears throat> more of a dream more of a, a story as opposed to like this is truth about you you know so yeah so Tipitaka versus Padmasambhava so that's what I mean by that that's what I meant by that when I wrote it um, is looking at the Arbitel looking at you know if you're a hundred percent a good Christian boy then you can call upon these powerful spirits that can create the Philosopher's Stone. Like looking at that as a fantastical story. It's, yeah, it's fine. Approaching it as like, really? <laughs> you know? It's just two different ways of looking at it. That was, I think that's what I meant by that. Alright. Critical of the rules for a cult versus we is what I wrote. 
Not much to say about something so far out it resembles fantasy fiction, only less grounded and maybe with a moral? Uh, yet millions... Oh, right, about Padma Sambhava. Millions, maybe, of people believe it to be literally true, or at least a few. I mean, one guy came on and was commenting the one time I was like, uh, when I first started reading Life and Liberation of Padma Sambhava, and it was saying someone lived to be a thousand years old, and I'm like, really? A thousand years old? Mm. And then someone came on and was like, well, back in those days, you know, we don't have a historical record of anything prior to Ur. So this, you know, was 10,000 years before, you know, and so I was like, oh, this person thinks it's literally true, and they're trying to convince me that it is possible that it was literally true. Okay. Um, I mean, all right. And that tells you where I'm coming from and where other people are coming from on that. Uh, it's mostly astral. Right. Kess said that to me once. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's mostly astral. It's just kind of like that covers it as far as that goes. Um, talking about that talking about Padma Sambhava, but maybe also talking about this other stuff with the with the Olympic planetary spirits. Maybe. Alright. Uh, it opens the doors wide to a more Jungian and possibly paranoid approach. Right. That's the thing. And that's, oh yeah, yeah. So then I wrote, so keep your consensus reality common sense sword handy in case you need to cut the knot. Right? I think it's a very good thing, um, especially kind of seeing, well, my dad didn't have that quite as much, so he would go completely in, all the way in, to these sort of very astral, like, so-and-so's a psychic and says that this is happening, and if that's the case, then woo-wee, and like, you could see the hair stand up on the back of his neck, because he's really experiencing something frightening where if he had a little injection of, you know, my grandpa Edward on my mom's side, then he, would ha we'd ha he like me, would have had that backup of going, yeah, but come on. It's like if somebody reads my astrological chart and they're like, you are a very analytical person and you're blonde and you have blue eyes and I'm like, wow, there's something to this stuff. And they're like, and you're going to die tomorrow. Then I have like the common sense sword, the, the, the consensus reality, intellectual science and reason based uh, side of me that I can just be like, oh, well, that's bullshit. Even if it's like the top astrologer in the whole world, you know what I mean? I think it's, it's like a tool, it can be, in that context, if you want to go de into this stuff. Uh, all right, in its time and place, translated in the 1650s, 45-ish years after the Fama, in the time of Protestant England, but when was the original text written? Then I looked it up on Wikipedia, 1575, it was translated in Latin, I mean, it was, it was published in Latin, people wrote things in Latin back then, in Switzerland. Uh, well, there you go. Like to imagine it was one of the pre-Fama RC brethren, but who knows? Maybe Paracelsus? Easy to say what idiots people were slash are, but while it seems a scratch, what? While it seems a stretch, the same flashlight hermit analogy can apply to those who only accept peer-reviewed papers as reality. I mean, maybe. Uh, though that's a can of worms that inadvertently lends more credibility to Flat Earth era than they deserve. Era? Flat Earthers, I think that was an autocorrect. It didn't like Flat Earthers. Autocorrect doesn't yet know what an Earther, Earthers are. Um, so what that is, is it's a reference to transformations, where he drew an analogy, sort of, where he talked about hermits in dungeon cells, and then eventually they each get a flashlight and they think the flashlight is like the uh, the light of the universe and then someone just opens all the doors at once and the hermits are all looking out at each other and each of them have a flashlight and it sort of implies that they are, they're all um, gonna argue whose flashlight is the light of the universe right so I was saying it's a stretch 
but you could apply that analogy also to the consensus reality paradigm of today. So what is common sense for, let's say, you and me, although that's probably not the best example, maybe someone else, right? Normal people, two reg regular people at work who aren't like weird, you know, aren't like religious or, or uh, into magic or occultism or metaphysics. Just normal people, you know, like they're more interested in what, what happened in yesterday's episode of Loki but they're not like really getting too far into it. Really, you know what I mean? Um, their paradigm could be, and their sense of what is real and what is normal, you know, maybe ceasing to exist at the point of death as a, as a reality, as a truth that they've accepted or not knowing and thinking that it's fine not to know or maybe best not to know agnosticism taken as a uh, as an answer to the great profound questions of life uh, might be a flashlight in that hermit dungeon that's that's all I was saying there but again and then I also acknowledge that that's a stretch is uh, you know Thelemites versus uh, you know traditional occultists is that that's more like the hermits with the flashlights right you know versus Christians versus uh, Jews and Muslims. <laughs> Alright, so, uh, yes, rage can come in any paradigm egregore, that means group think, egregore, at those not living up to standards within the paradigm, or those who seem to be attacking their paradigm from the outside of their paradigm. Right. People get rage whether they're, whether they're atheists, scientists, or Christians, or occultists, or what. You know, rage can come up, and that's one of those things that I think that paths like yoga and Buddhism are uh, specifically designed to help you deal with, as is therapy, and, you know, I try not to get enraged too much. It happens, though, but I know that it's not good, rather than just being like, oh, you, I hate you, I want to kill you, you know, like, like, yeah, sometimes you feel that, but... Do your best not to without making it into like a monster you're keeping in your closet that just grows and grows. You know, Jung, I guess, gets into that. We haven't gotten to that in our readings yet, but anyway. All right. Always found it hard to go along with the logic of Christian philosophers of yester centuries. I wrote that. I agree with it. Perhaps my sense of scientific reason as authoritative is rooted in Grandpa Edward. Yes, you know, maybe. But at the same time, I think that uh, that was nicely, nicely designed by the universe. That the, like the, the greatest man in my personal life, personal circle, whom I admire most, more than my dad, I admit, was a, was a scientist. He was my grandpa, my grandpa Edward. He was, uh, you know, of Dutch descent. His ancestors went back to New Amsterdam, 1600s. Had blonde hair, but he helped make the airplanes that fought the Nazis. You see, see the subtlety there. That's that's where my root identity is, is in being a blonde who hates Nazis. Right? It's basic. Um, but he wasn't, he wasn't a lefty, though. He, call, he called uh, the peace sign the footprint of the American chicken. But, you know, I say anything that's, like, negative about Grandpa Edward, I just go, oh, well, it's his generation. And all the positive, I'm like, he was a great man. You know, like, he just, I love him. He died when I was 10. First body I ever saw. And he had this expression on his face. <gasps> I don't know if I did it justice, but... When I took DMT, I, I was like, oh, that's what my grandpa was seeing. Maybe. All right. So, yes, th science, scientism as authoritative implanted and imprinted upon my particular uh, paradigm, microcosm. Acknowledging that there's probably a lot of folks who don't have that. And it kind of makes me, all right, I can accept more. I can accept like people like this guy Mike that's a total like flat earther, the moon and the sun are projections, you know, like he's a fan of my ritual videos. Hi Mike if you're watching. 
Hope you're doing well. Anyway, um, different mic probably if you're not the one that matches that description. Never mind. Anyway, um, yeah, he probably didn't have a grandpa that he's named after who was a scientist and a great man who invented things that, you know, probably didn't have that in his life. And maybe that, that made a difference. Okay, but approaching the Arbitel in something like its own paradigm, with all previous qualifiers in place, everything I've said in this video thus far in the past hour, um, and acknowledging the problematic elements of Abrahamic in general and Catholic in particular. I mean, I pointed out that both Switzerland in the 1500s and England in the 1600s would have been pretty Protestant, but the, Pro the Protestants in those times and places were pretty Catholic-ish. More so in Switzerland in the 1500s. And never mind, but all he did was translate it in the 1600s. But. All right, all right, continuing. Um, as well as religious in general, from an atheist point of view, or a non-religious point of view, yeah, so that's what we're doing here. I'm, uh, that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm going to be doing in episode 5 and moving forward. I just kind of wanted to let you guys know I'm not a total nutter. Or maybe I am. But, uh, you know, I see all this. This is kind of all informing where I'm coming from and why I even bother to read this. And why I'm interested in it. Why I am giving it a little bit of space in my brain and time and energy. Why I think it's worth looking at where I'm coming from. Um, I'm going to be approaching it on its own terms, in its own paradigm, in its own world. I'm going to be pretending to be a Swiss guy in the 1500s or an English guy in the 1600s when really I'm uh, an American guy in India in 2023 who doesn't even really practice uh, Golden Dawn anymore with a few exceptions. Although it is close to my heart and it took, you know, it was a big part of my life for a long time and uh, it informs my paradigm in a lot of ways and the eyes through which I view the world is that golden dawn paradigm um, but built upon a foundation of a more reason based science based mercur mercurial uh, paradigm also my not much efforts misunderstanding of the Olympics by way Right. Yeah, I don't know. I was... I did the autocorrect fuck that up, but I did talk about that. How... Well, maybe my teachers understood more about the Arbitel and uh, the Olympic spirits. I didn't care enough to look into it, so I just kind of thought of them as kind of basically interchangeable with the regular planetary spirits and the, uh, the hierarchy. Um, hierarchies, right? So yeah, yeah, if you get to, if you're one with Jesus, then since he's the, uh, the ultimate authority in the hierarchy of this spiritual paradigm, then uh, spirits have to obey you whether they want to or not. And that, I admit, is the paradigm I come from when I do my healing work, which by the way is often effective, so I don't know. I'm not saying maybe it's true, I'm just saying it's a familiar paradigm that works, and I can see how there's problematic elements with it, which uh, manifest themselves on the lower levels in things like the British Empire, let alone the Roman one. Okay, the Roman one was a little earlier, but never mind, I'll keep reading. I think that's everything that was keeping me awake at night. All right, so there's the end of the notes, and before this video goes on way too much longer, I will go ahead and bid you...